the distance between an idea to a creation is very narrow, and that the beautiful thing about the world they live in is that the there's almost no gap between a concept that they might have and a thing that they want to make. There's a language around this that kids are very familiar with. They want to create. We just get in the way. It, we really do get in the way. Hello, and welcome back to the Hannah Frankman podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Jimmy Sony. Jimmy is an author who's written a number of biographies, including his most recently published book, The Founders, which tells the story of the PayPal mafia, both in the early days of PayPal, but also at the early stages of the careers of each person who was involved building PayPal. And there were a couple of reasons why I was really excited to have Jimmy on the show. First of all, I wanted to talk to him about his experience as a biographer during the age of the internet because so much about how we write biographies has changed now that we have almost infinite access to information online. And I really wanted to talk to him both about how he thinks about finding and sifting through information on the internet, but also how he thinks about the changing role of books in a world where we have infinite access to information and also how the way that he engages with information online has changed how he thinks about education. Because Jimmy was a very good student inside of traditional school. He was on the very status quo trajectory for most of his educational career and also his early professional career. And the way that he engages with information on the internet has shifted some how he thinks about education. And so I wanted to talk to him about these things. I also wanted to talk to him about the fact that during the pandemic, he started a pod school for his daughter in New York City, where he lives with a few of his friends and their kids. And so I also wanted to talk to him about how he thought about building out a school and what was important for him in that experience and what he learned along the way. Jimmy is a fascinating person, and I really enjoyed getting to talk to him for this interview, and I hope you enjoy listening. Actually, let me ask you about that. That might be an interesting entry point to this. Uh, like, you're a commentator. You're a writer. You spend all of your time putting words out on the internet, and it feels like the landscape of what's safe to say keeps changing is this a thing that hampers you at all when you're working creatively or do you just like not care at this point? It's a, it's a good question. I think it's something that all people who are doing any kind of public work these days deal with. But I think canceling has jumped the shark. <laughs> like, I gotta be honest. Like, it, it was a, there was like a period where it was like, like something that, you know, was unforeseen and like you could, you know, and people still get in trouble for like truly egregious things. But at this point, like, isn't everyone canceled? Like, like, didn't we just cancel everybody? Like, I remember when I heard that, like, they were trying to cancel Barack Obama. And I was like, all right, that's it. Like, we've, <laughs> this is truly jumped the shark now. Like, you, you, you've you, really lost it, right? Um, I don't know. I, To be honest, so half my work is public work where I write books and occasional essays and op-eds and things. And then half my work is I'm ghostwriting and speechwriting for other people. I would say with the ghostwriting and speechwriting, I'm sensitive because my clients are sensitive. I try to be careful about making sure they're not going to have anything happen to them. But honestly, with, with the stuff that I do, because I'm an independent writer, meaning that like it's either a publisher's underwriting some portion of my work or I'm working my day job while doing my work, I don't uh, I don't, I don't like conform to anyone. Like I don't need to conform to like a style guide or like a cancellation guide from some publication. Um, if a publication rejects a piece I wrote, I just go to another publication and there's like a million of them, right? So it's not the end of the world if somebody says, I don't like what you say, because I can just, like, I just put it up on Substack. I don't care. Um, I think the, the, the more textured or nuanced or really like thoughtful answer is, to me, cancellation is primarily like an economic bludgeon. You're not going to lose influence if you get canceled these days. If anything, your influence would go up, right? I've seen friends whose book sales go through the roof when they get canceled. And everybody's a little bit like, oh, all you got to do is get canceled and you get to number one on Amazon. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that for people who are younger in their careers, it can be devastating. I mean, I've talked to people who have had to rebuild their entire lives, who have had to like lost mortgages, all kinds of things. So I think in that way, it's still a pernicious force. Like it's still something that... I, people should just be careful to guard against it in the sense that I just don't think it's good. Like the whole mob thing is just not, I don't know, it just feels very, it, it feels like the Salem witch trials, you know? And it, I, thought, I thought we learned these lessons. <laughs> like well, I thought the last generation learned them. We have to relearn them yeah. again, apparently. You're a student of history. You know this. You have to no, learn right. again and again. I, 
like I, I take a look at, for example, like what's happening to Michael Lewis with this book that he released on SBF, and I'm like, how many of these people tweeting have actually sat down and read the book, right? Or, or even like, how many of these people have read a book in the last three months? Like, <laughs> let's be honest, it's not going to be that many because I know because I'm an author and I know how few people read books. I know what kind of time it takes. It's like why I try to do the work I do in the way I do because I know that there's endless media temptations that are far more, in some ways, far more exhilarating and dopamine inducing than sitting down and reading a book. Ergo, you just have to do work differently. But like, I just know that most of these people commenting on things are not, haven't really read this book. So the criticism feels unfair and a little bit below the belt. I, though, though in general, my, my original point stands. I think cancel a culture, at this point, like healthy majorities of Americans in every public poll despise cancel culture. And I think it's because people fundamentally recognize that like forgiveness is a virtue, number one. Two, everybody makes mistakes. And three, we have a legal system for the worst of the worst of the worst kinds of mistakes. And mistakes of, of omission or of a syllable wrong here or there that were done without malice, most people roll their eyes and like move along, right? And I think, I think, it's, I think it's bad both for the people who are the pitchfork wielders, like the people who are like out to get people. I don't think very much of those people. But I also think that like the most vocal voices on the other side who are like, oh, cancel culture is the thing that's holding everything back. That's the thing. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, actually, there are a lot more things holding people back than that. Uh, it's not the fear of cancellation. I have had one really interesting experience, which is I've noticed in my publishing contracts, they introduce these little cancellation clauses now, which always makes me laugh a little bit. Uh, it's like a really goofy little thing that they've had to do because that's what has to happen. And I find that kind of funny. I find it funny for the exact reason I said earlier, which is like, if you get canceled, your book sales go up. I mean, it's a bit, you know, it can be a big boost. Um, but you don't, you know, my, my, I have a friend, I, I'm writing a pro and I'm working on a writing project with right now. His name is Jeff Kane. And we were texting about this and he goes, man, I've been canceled like five times. <laughs> he's, he's like, at this point. It's almost like if you didn't get canceled, you're not at the table, you know? Right. Um, but, I, but I will say, I don't, where I don't mean to be so glib about it is for people who are not independently wealthy and who lost like jobs or healthcare as a result of something they did that was not malicious and their organization caved. And I think this is like especially true at universities, right? Mm -hmm. For all various reasons that other people have gone into further than me or deeper than me. That's, those are really unfortunate stories. Like those stories actually do kind of break your heart. Yeah, I think there's, I almost see ca cancelization as happening, occurring in different buckets. There's like different types of effect for people who, like what you just described, they lose a job, their ability to be reemployed in their field goes away. That's really devastating. That's really unfair. There's a different type of cancellation that I think happens among people who make a significant part of their living or at least a significant part of their ecosystem exists within the commentary world where it almost becomes mm -hmm. a badge of honor like you said like if you don't get canceled are you saying something interesting and this is the thing i think a lot about a lot very philosophically like i'm not important mm. enough yet to get canceled nobody cares yet about what i'm give saying. it time and Hannah. cancellation will happen to you too well that's i soon think, enough i think about this because you know, <laughs> there are jackets and a membership card it's <laughs> wait 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 you get a jacket <laughs> Nobody told me about this. It's actually a jacket with a with a with a letter with a red A on it. It's oh, it's you know an, an homage to Hester Prynne. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cool. Uh, can I get it in like blue or black or something? I feel like that would go well with my wardrobe. Um, no, this is I, your Etsy store. This is this is the this is what's going to underwrite everything else. The vodka, everything. <laughs> but I feel like you have to be careful because people, when they want to cancel you, when you say something that when you're saying something that's maybe not cancelable, but that bothers them, you're coming after something or you're threatening some establishment that they don't like. They go back and they find things that you said years ago that you thought nothing of because you had 300 followers on Twitter and nobody cared. And so the thing I, I think about it a lot, the the, the weird mm. juxtaposition between the cultural narrative that it's devastating, and sometimes it is, and this the simultaneous cultural narrative that it's a thing that actually amplifies you and makes you seem more mm. legitimate. It's like, okay, this person, the establishment doesn't like them, therefore they must be interesting. It's a weird juxtaposition. Um, but I want to know about what a cancel contract is, or a cancel clause in your contract is. Oh, yeah, it's this, it's this thing that, like, I guess, I have to look back at the specific terms of it. And other authors have written about this, but basically it says... That if there's, it's, a, it's so vague, it's like deliciously vague. You know, some like genius lawyer came up with this, but it's basically like if something bad happens to you, 
like that's a public something something that would reflect badly on such and such. We can rescind the yada yada. I mean, it's something like where they could take back money, oh. right? And it's because you, it's because like all these authors had moments where they were canceled, and then they're in the middle of a book deal, and the publisher, under pressure from usually just a handful of internal voices, has to cancel a book project or deplatform somebody. And so now they're just writing this in so that you can like it can be a thing. And I, I think it's just a part of you know these these publishers are not. They're owned by big conglomerates who are very worried about, and some of them are publicly traded. Or you know, it's like they gotta like keep up, up appearances for the SEC right. and for the Twitterati, I guess. What I would, what I would like, it's actually interesting. I, I know I'm being glib and like kind of. I, it's also because I, I don't think I don't tweet very often. I'm not important enough to merit like a full frontal, the full frontal like assault or whatever. And maybe I'll feel differently when that happens. But I, I would offer a couple of observations. One is. Even even if like it still is fundamentally like an economic kind of coercion, right? So if you were independently wealthy, and you didn't depend on any kind, like you didn't have any kind of economic dependency, you could like theoretically somebody could find something you said five years ago, and they could try to cancel you. And it wouldn't. It really it would affect. It wouldn't affect your influence because at this point, especially on like Twitter, you can't be deplatformed. You know, it, but it would. It wouldn't affect your like ability to pay the mortgage and eat food, right? And so. You kind of have it. Still, is this? But I think what's that? What that's done is it's led to a rise of independent creators who sense that if they are attached to the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times and they say certain things that are outside of the Overton window for the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, they're going to get like you know canned if they do that. And so what they do is they're just like, well, I'll just use a combination of Patreon, you know, grants from Tyler Cowen, and like maybe like one or two other things. And figure out how to cobble this together, and that way they can have on whoever they want. I, I don't think everybody could do that, but I know enough people who do that it suggests that what's happened is is like a response to cancel culture has been pots of money like that are available for people who don't have to be tied to an institutional philosophy in order to get that money, right? And so that's like one one way to think about it. The other thing I think about is. I spent a lot of time over the last couple of years reading about Galileo. I was like, I just get into topics and thinking about a book project, you know, down the line on Galileo. And we act like, you know, being like, like you're ratioed on Twitter is a big deal. But Galileo is placed under house arrest. <laughs> like, and with like the, the Inquisition almost could have killed him, you know? And 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 I think that there's like a a, a um, it's worth keeping a healthy dose of perspective about your critics and their power against you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do a great job of this in general. I, it's hard. You, you as a creator, you get anxiety if you someone says something bad about something you did. You're like, oh man, that sucks. I wish I, you know. It's not fun to go through these things, but you're not being tried by the Spanish government. <laughs> you know, like your 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 life is not at risk. Like Galileo couldn't see his daughter. Oh, yeah, she was in a nunnery, so you couldn't see her anyway. But he couldn't like travel and do things. He couldn't collaborate with other scientists. And so I think there's like a a kind of historical perspective that's useful. That ideas have always been dangerous, and ideas that push limits have always. I and mean, like people have always come under attack. Some of the most interesting thinkers I know are the ones who are most attacked. And honestly, at this point, I, I often think that if you're if someone's not opposing you, you haven't really said it. I mean, it's sort of cliche. It's a little trite, but it's like you haven't. If you're not opposed, you haven't said anything interesting. My final, my final thought on this is, is interesting. I haven't really thought about it that much. I mean, I guess I have, but just in the back of my head. Yeah. Cancel culture also refines, it, it, it uh, forces people who are doing work in public to step up their game. People may not want to admit that, but I will give you an example. When I was thinking about the founders, mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about the fact that some of the people I've been writing about are enemies of this or that political faction, right? On both sides. There's like very high profile people who are within that group, founding the founding employees of PayPal, who are loathed by one or another side of the political spectrum. And, and I kept thinking that actually, this the great challenge of this book is can I make people on both sides like force, like grumble even and read it and like actually appreciate something in it? even if they despise the politics of some of the other people within that story. And so what did that force me to do? It forced me to widen the aperture on people I was interviewing, tell a story, tell stories that like had nothing to do with politics. And I made this a rule for myself. You will not find the word Democrat or Republican within the founders. Even though 
many of these people who are, you know, in some cases billionaires, have funded various political things because politics had nothing to do with this story. And so I, it, it act, like in a weird way, I, I was, I would, maybe was, I was like um, anticipating a punch, you know, like in boxing, but, but I was also thinking about how to make the project more interesting as a result. And I, I really like that. Like, it's like, it makes it almost like, hmm, how do I, how do I like cancel proof this? But not in a way that like sands down the rough edges, more just how do I make this more interesting so that I have to begrudgingly get you to like it, even if you don't like some of the people within it. I think that is such an important insight. I also think, I didn't realize this until the moment you said it, I think that's the first time that the words Democrat or Republican were said on this podcast too. Uh, Not there you go. like even super intentionally, just... And I mean, you know, the people that I've had on the show, some of them do talk about politics outside in the, in the context of the commentary that they do, the writing that they do, et cetera. But I think it's so tempting to lean into the political side of things when you're telling stories because it gets a lot of cheap clicks because it's controversial and people, there's always some drama attached to politics. So it's very easy to ride those waves of momentum. But I think so many stories get lost in trying to be too clickbaity from the standpoint mm. of politics, that we miss the fact that so many things transcend politics altogether and really have nothing to do with it. And that's like the least important part of the story. And so I think I think that that's really important from a commentary standpoint at large, whether you're a writer, whether you're a podcaster, whether you do shorter form, like you're really active on Twitter. I think there's so much to be said if you skip over the political side of things and you don't mm-hmm. fall into that trap. And so I'm really glad that you said that because I think that's really interesting. I also want to talk about your book, The Founders, and your books in general because you've done some really interesting projects. You've chosen very, very interesting characters to tell stories about and you've gone deep down the rabbit hole and there's a lot around your process that I want to talk about and the books in general and what you've learned from them. But I want to go back first. You made a comment earlier when you were talking about cancellation about how reading books is a tough sell because there are so many other Mm -hmm. dopamine hits that people can get. And I feel like you're in a very interesting position in the history of authors because you're writing at a time where there's more more pulls and competition for people's attention than there arguably ever has been. And I'm really curious how you think about that from a craftsmanship standpoint. Like, do you think Mm. that what a book has to be is different than it was a couple of decades ago because of social media and the internet? Like, do you think the art form has actually changed or is it just the sales process that has changed to get people to pick up a book? What is like, how do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, the, the the short answer is I think about it basically all the time. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's basically like endless stream of thoughts on this subject. Um, it's a, it's such a great question and there's so many different angles and 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 kind of places like rabbit holes we could go down. So let's just go down all of them. Um, I think you'd be foolish if you're an author and you're not thinking about the way that like culture has changed the reading experience or how like readers will find you in the modern age, right? And I think there was like, an, like I have all these author friends who are a couple generations older than me and they like succeeded and they kind of have the luxury of like not doing any of the stuff that some of us who are still hustling have to do to, but, and and I think there was a time when it was thought to be like de classe to have to do like marketing or or, you know, internet things or PR or whatever. But that is like a bygone age now. So as an author, you have an obligation to like learn this stuff and figure it out. I'm not necessarily somebody who's the best at it. I have friends who are like Jedi masters at the stuff. Um, But what I would say, a few few things. One is um, the publishing industry has always had a hostile relationship with Amazon. It's no great secret. There were lawsuits. I think there might still be lawsuits. You know, they kind of like woke up too late on all the things Amazon was doing. But Amazon created the ultimate distribution platform for the thing that I happen to do in the world. And it actually expanded the total market for the thing that I happen to do in the world. And it did it with digital technology, which is great. Like audiobooks, I sell more audiobooks every week than I sell any other kind of format, right? So I don't like, it's like, like I sell more audiobooks in a given week usually than hardcover and Kindle put together. And so that's amazing. And also Kindle, like 
another, you know, genre, like another format that was created that gives me more access to a market that wants to read a little bit differently. So I, I think that while it's, well, the, the easy thing to say is, oh my God, it's so hard because, you know, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is so good and it's so much more entertaining than a book. Right? Like, yeah. And there are still readers and like reading went up considerably during the pandemic. Audiobooks are, are increasing in total sales volume year after year after year. And we're still miles, we have miles to go before people, like before that runway ends. Um, the other, so that's one thing is like, yes, it's hard, but technology has also expanded the total pie in a way that should be very encouraging to authors. Um, by the way, the other thing that it did is like, you can buy a Kindle book for less than you can buy a hardcover in many cases. And it actually has like lowered the barrier to entry. Kindle was often will do like discount deals and stuff where you can get books for 99 cents and that'll spike your sales, right? So that's kind of one thought. The second thought I have about it is it, it's radically simplified the act of doing a book. Like, I, I, there are a million things that I am so glad that I do not have to do today that I would have had to do 10, 20, 30 years ago. The programs that you can have, for example, for something as simple as endnotes or footnotes, that just like, oh my God, the hours that you save or can pour back into the actual like writing of the thing instead of citing the thing, that alone is like a godsend. And we wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for, for you know, modern technology. The, the other thing I think about a lot, this is like my counterintuitive take is, and I have a friend, Luke Burgess, who is somebody that like he, he thinks about all this stuff a lot too. He wrote the book Wanting. He's, an, he's big on, you know, his studies have been in mimetic desire and Rene Girard. And he and I talk about how actually what's counterintuitive is in an era of TikTok, someone who does a book is crazy enough to be interesting. <laughs> right? so, so in an era of like four minute things, spending four years on a thing is actually counterintuitive. It's actually like, whoa, look at this weirdo, you know? And it's not like the weirdo who's like walking around town square yelling about the end of days. It's like, oh, somebody actually woke up every day for years and put themselves into this thing, this format, as opposed to just like the very quick hit that anyone can do. And because there's still a threshold for books, meaning like you still have to have, like you still have to actually work to, to get it done, um, it becomes qualitatively different than a tweet, a post, a whatever, a, you know. And so that is encouraging to me. So like, it's encouraging that I'm kind of doing the thing. I'm swimming upstream of where culture is going. It's like, everyone else is doing this. I'm going to keep doing this thing that Gutenberg, you know, you know, from the, that era. And I, I like that. I like that it takes time to do books well. And I think that's good. I also like, I try to just see these things optimistically. Like if I, you know, the, the, the pessimistic case is easy to make, like, because nobody pays attention, you know, book sales are going to go down the tubes. Authors aren't gonna be able to make money. Sure. But those constraints have always kind of been around. Like the advent of television made people think that book, book reading would, and it's like none of this stuff actually kills the form. You just have to make the form work for whatever the, you know, the era you're in. For, in my case, for example, like my chapters are definitely shorter than they probably would have been like 10 or 15 years ago. With every subsequent book, I try to, you know, those little spacers like in between chapters, like the little gaps, mm -hmm. I try to have more of those because I know my readers got a shorter attention span. Um, I take the audiobook more seriously. I think I think a lot more about it. And I also like do everything I can to be available online for certain periods so that people can connect with me as an author because I know that's something readers want to do. I I think that it does, I will say it interferes with the, getting the work done. But in general, I'm very like, I'm very sanguine about all these things. Like I'm like, the market's bigger, the tools are better, way better. And like, I really can like have, have swim against cultural tides. What about on the research side of things? When you're doing a book, you have access to everything that's on the internet. I'm really curious about how that affects your process. It's, it's like that, it's a freaking gold mine. <laughs> like, do we, do you, do like, the, you know, people have no idea how long, like I, I came of age in the computing era. Like when I was really young, we got a computer. I think I was, must've been eight, eight or nine years old. And we had an internet connection because we lived near Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. I dialed up for internet and like downloaded things and like learned about computing on MS-DOS. 
The ability to access any video for any person I'm writing about or find an audio file tucked in some nook and cranny of the internet is the most amazing thing that like is ever like I like feel like I'm embarrassingly lucky every day, right? I would say that it does raise the bar for looking in places that people don't expect. So I'll give an example, like from my work on founders. One of the things that I did for that book is, you know, you people have like all these like, contemporary commentary about Peter Thiel. But I was writing about Peter Thiel like shortly after he graduated from college and law school. So I went back to the Stanford Daily and I went back through like years of archives of involvements that he had when he was at Stanford and just after. And it, it was really illuminating. It's an archive that would be impossible if not for tech that we have today. And it's also an archive that like you're not going to find looking on Google. It just doesn't index as well on Google, right? And so you just have to be a little bit more disciplined and diligent about where you find stuff. But it, but everything from the C-SPAN archive to the to the overall internet archive where you can look at old versions of web pages to Vimeo to it's like I it's an embarrassment of riches for somebody who writes history because especially if you're writing about somewhat contemporary figures, you can find the most interesting stuff. You can look on and see the earliest podcasts they did. I mean, it, it's it's wild what you can find. I found. I'll give you an example. I found Elon Musk's college student government platform from the University of Pennsylvania when he was running and lost for student government uh, at UPenn. And it's like, and that, and that was just tucked away. Nobody had seen it or found it or anything. And I was just like, whoa, wait, Elon ran for student government, didn't win, and his platform is hilarious, right? And so it was this like amazing gem. But I, I, to me, that's just the, the work of doing research for people who are in my line of work, which is like narrative nonfiction history, is so much better now. I mean, it really, it's like, it's so much better. You're almost, what you're faced with is not, not how am I going to get the information, but what information am I going to leave out? I feel like, so I spend a lot of time talking about this on the internet, which you may or may not have seen um, about how different education is now that we have the internet because you have everything available at your fingertips in a matter of seconds, maybe minutes, if you you know have to work a little bit to concoct the correct search terms to find what you're looking for. And obviously you have to go deep down archives to find things, it takes work, but you can be on the path looking for whatever it is you wanna learn about in a matter of like however much time it takes you to pull up a browser tab and type in an initial Google search. And that's just, that changes everything about how we think about learning because so much of how we've done education historically is predicated on the fact that you have to go somewhere to have physical access to information and you have to find people who are gatekeepers for information because you had to go through this process manually. There wasn't, the, the automatic version hadn't been created yet. And so what you're doing is really interesting to me because you're living it out in real time. You're also monetizing it, which is super cool. And I also want to get into, like, you're getting paid to learn. That's just the coolest thing ever for any aspiring audit act. That is the dream is to get paid to learn cool things. But I want to, I'm really curious. I want to dig in a little bit to how you think about not just like research, the research process mm -hmm. of being able to go on the internet and find things for your books, but also how that's shifted, how you think about learning more broadly. And maybe some of the things you think were like the average layperson who has not researched a book and gone deep down rabbit holes and found videos of Elon Musk when he was in college applying for something and or running for something and losing. Um, like what, what we're missing in the conversation of accessibility of information, learning things, wherever you want to take this? Yeah, no, it's it's a really it's a really good question. And I, I'm afraid I, I, I hope my answers aren't going to be too facile because it's not something I've thought about like in as much depth as I probably should. What what I would say is is that if I had like a meta commentary about it, right, which is it's great to have a surplus of information, but the reason that I I'm able to be effective is because I have deadlines, a contract, and a project, right? So it, it is it is still the case that the container into which all of this YouTube, C-SPAN, all this stuff is, is being poured is specific. It has dates. It has an end con construct, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a test, but the test is, did I get chapter three done? And did I get it done on time? And did I let my editor know that it got done on time? Or did I hold myself accountable? So the challenge of a surplus of information to me isn't, 
it's, it's actually not, I don't think it's misinformation. I think it's discipline and I think it's like accountability. And so that, that's the tricky balance. Like, you know, it, it, it I think about this a lot with my daughter, who's who's really into gymnastics. So we'll watch like gymnast videos, right? And like I have these gymnastics mats and stuff. We'll watch these gymnast YouTube videos. But the distance between seeing a thing, learning about a thing, and applying it is two seconds. And we're able, and then you know, and then she'll go to classes and it'll be reinforced and whatnot. The the challenge I think for a lot of people is that they are omnivorous consumers of information, but there's no production function. There's nothing coming out on the other end, and so you don't nothing sticks. The, the reason that I was militant about these rabbit holes with, you know, the Stanford Daily or the, the, the whatever, the Daily, the Daily Pennsylvanian at Wharton was because I was trying to ask myself the question, why is this book going to be more interesting than Ashley Vance's book or than Zero to One or than any of the other books that are out there? And it's like, if I find a nugget that no one's found, that's cool. That's gold. But I had a purpose there, so it was much more directed. I think that that's like the best learners I know online like even the best newsletters that I follow, there's a there's still an output and they have to be, they have to improve the quality of their taste over time and continue to show up with something valuable for their audience. And that's the forcing function. But I think if you don't have a forcing function and you're just watching YouTube videos, like that's, I, I don't necessarily think of that as the most effective <laughs> means of, of learning. I mean, again, there might be people who are like rabidly for or rabidly against this, but I gather that you know, project-based learning that has digital tools associated with it is a good description of what basically like my life is, right? I have projects. There are a whole bunch of digital tools that amplify and, and you know, increase and, and make that work more efficient and make it more enjoyable. But it, they're still the fundamental project. I'm still, you know, if you were to abstract it at its most basic level, like in college, you maybe wrote like a thousand word essay or maybe a 2000 word essay for a class that you would get a grade. I'm writing a 140,000 word essay and I get a dollar amount and the grade is, you know, critics and audience and whatever. So there's a little bit of, it's still very, it's almost like sort of still boxed in. You know, I'm not kind of doing it for the love of the game. Like, I mean, there's some things I learned because I love, but they're, I'm not doing the books for the love of the game. I'm, I love them, but I, there's a game, you know, <laughs> I guess there's, I, I, that's the that's the tricky part. I think it's like the information is still, I still looking and digging and researching with a purpose. I think there, there's a lot in what you just said that's highly interesting. Um, one of the points being the connection drawn between learning within the game of school and learning within the game of real world uh, incentives. And I think the the former thing that you just described, the you know kids sitting or rather you, people, not kids, but adults, whoever right. going on the internet and they watch a YouTube video about Elon Musk and they find it super interesting. And then that's kind of the end of it. It feels akin to, in some ways, like the sort of rinse and repeat process of schooling where you just like, you learn mm. something in a short period of time, you maybe get quizzed on it and then you move on. And there's no deeper purpose application that's getting repeated over and over that's causing you to retain and apply which, I mean, I've worked in the education space for a long time, and this has been one of the core things of a lot of the programs that I've been a part of and the things that I've done is this idea of, of learning to the task and learning in a very applied sense around projects. I mean, all the stuff, I, there's tons of stuff that I, rabbit holes I've gone down on the internet at night when I can't sleep on Wikipedia because I think they're really awesome that I don't remember or I vaguely remember, but I couldn't just spit out at you all of the details about this article that I read about the history of a revolutionary area of era of Philadelphia. And like, I went down this weird rabbit hole of like, I don't know, people who wrote newspapers or whatever. And like, I can't remember the details. I read this thing once I thought it was cool. It disappeared again because I didn't have an application for it. So I think this point that you're making is really important about you have this accessibility of information, but it's only useful to the extent that you're making it useful and doing something with it that's causing it to become active knowledge, not just passive knowledge. Do you think more people would benefit from like having some type of whether they as a project that they're working on a newsletter some application where like if people are passively learning about things because they want to be bettering themselves should most of those people also be writing newsletters or something like what's your take on this yes i mean unequivocally yes like if only because you could do it like like you know even if you do it for simple reasons or in simple ways it invests the thing it invests the exercise with meaning 
right? So I'll, I'll pull it out of this context. I'll give it a totally different context. So I, uh, I'm a parent and I have an eight-year-old daughter. And one of the amazing things about kids is kids just say like the wildest stuff all the time. And it's hilarious. And it's also like heartwarming, it's meaningful, and it's totally random. And you just never know like what's gonna come out of their mouths. And it's one of the best parts about being a parent is it's it's actually, my kid is so much more interesting than a Twitter feed, like just like all the time, right? She's just like, so like cause I just don't know what the hell she's gonna say, right? And it's like Taylor Swift one minute, gymnastics the next. And it's like, great. It's like, I it's, I don't need Twitter. I have I have an eight year old, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so what I did, because I was like, well, that's, that's great. What's a project? I mean, again, this is the way I'm wired, right? Mm -hmm. What's a project that I could build around this, this, this randomness that would be meaningful to me, that would be meaningful to my daughter, and that just like takes a thing and makes it more concrete? So here's what I did. Starting around when she was like, I think like two or three years old, I created a document on Google Docs called Venice Memories. My daughter's name is Venice. And for a period I did it every day. I would Every day I would come up with some random memory or something, and I would just literally like, like three sentences, write it in, write it in. And then when there were days where something like really epic happened, I would open up the little voice recording tool on Google Docs and I would just like go and talk into it. And I would like just like dump things. And then I occasionally I'd put in photos and stuff, but mostly it was a word thing. I wanted to capture the words she was saying, not images, because that my phone's there for that, right? It'll have it forever. Um, and that document is 172 pages long, right? Single space, like a basically single space. Um, the photos sometimes throw off the margins or whatever, but it's it's like 150 plus pages, let's say, conservatively. And it is just like random stuff that happened that I found was hilarious and just like stupid things, memories that only matter to me and her, right? But what it did was it created an output, a, a an actual measurable output for a loving relationship, but also something that like invested, like hey, she'll do something funny now. And I'll like, I'll be like, oh, I have to like, I like at night, I'm like, I have to whip out my phone, make sure I write that thing down. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the same principle carries over to, you know, if you're like, let's say learning about running or weightlifting or yoga or anything, there's likely, it's likely the case you can find a subreddit on it. And that subreddit is going to encourage you to contribute your thoughts, your experiences, anything. And you could do it anonymously if you're worried about somebody finding you. I mean, Anthony Bourdain famously was anonymously on Reddit while he was learning MMA. I don't know if you know about this, but no. he was, he, yeah, so this is an amazing story. It's one of my favorite Anthony Bourdain stories is that there was an MMA, like a mixed martial arts, for those who don't know the acronym, mm -hmm. uh, subreddit. And Anthony Bourdain, I guess, was like trying to learn how to be a mixed martial arts. He was like doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something. And someone on Reddit was seeing these like incredibly well-written posts on this subreddit. And someone, I guess, some Reddit user was like, you know, this sounds a lot like the writing of Anthony Bourdain when he's writing about cooking. Could it be? And then there were like these like random people would see him like entering or exiting a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. And then someone found out like, Holy crap, Anthony Bourdain has been contributing anonymously to the to the BJJ subreddit or whatever, or to the MMA subreddit. And and it just goes to show you that like even someone who has a platform didn't need to like contact a New Yorker and say, I'm gonna do 3,000 words on mixed martial arts. He just legit went on Reddit and was like, this is what happened to me when I get the hell beaten out of me, you know? And so from my perspective, like I don't know if he was thinking about it in the kind of august or, or you know, highfalutin terms that he was investing his process. I, I don't imagine that he was because he already had that process for his show and for other things. But you could see a universe in which literally any action you take or anything you do in your life, if you add a little bit of that public accountability and a little bit of that project, it suddenly takes your learning and it completely changes it. It's like one of the things I tell, I tell all my writer friends, I'm like, the best part about being a writer is I just read so differently. I just, it's, 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 I'm, I'm not reading usually, this is sort of sad. I'm not really reading for pleasure. I'm reading for technique. I'm reading for tips. I'm, I'm watching somebody and I'm saying, and I'm reading something and I'm like, damn, that like, I, I, I like, will look at a piece and I, I'm sitting by myself. This is how weird I am. I'll like sit by myself and I'll just look at it and I'll go, man, that person brought their A game, right? Like, it's like, it's like I'm watching like a sporting event, reading a Peggy Noonan column. I'm like, I'm like, damn, damn, Peggy, damn, you really brought it today. And so from my perspective, like you could do that about basically anything, right? And so why wouldn't you, given that it's so easy to do, 
and it will turn it into a project. And a, and a project is way more fun and way more disciplined than just having like idle internet time, which mm -hmm. is, this is particularly true, I think, of for, for parents that I find that the best way for my daughter to learn anything is for us to turn it into a project. And then she finds the resources to do the project, right? And so like, like, like we did this, we did this bake sale. I'm, I'm big on teaching her entrepreneurship. It's like, a, I really want her to like learn that, you know, she should be able to entrepreneurship broadly defined, by the way, create new things from scratch is like my definition from her is that in the mornings, like our time is spent generally creating new things from scratch. Because I think if she could like see, if she has an idea and she can get it to like the end product, that's like a good skill to learn broadly defined. And so I remember when we were doing the bake sale, I just kind of said like, okay, like what, what is going to make people want to like buy from you? Like what kind of signage do you want? You know, how are you going to make sure that everybody that can pay can pay, right? All these things. And because it was a project, it was different than if I had said, oh, we're going to like go, you know, buy some cookies or you're going to like buy some cookies and then resell them, right? Um, I think for me, project-based learning is basically like my entire life is that. And I, I think the road, the pathways to do that are more available than they've ever been. I want to talk about this more in the context of parenting and how you mm. approach this with your daughter. So if you feel like information is better retained when it's applied either in a real world application, like an entrepreneurial project or publicly sharing the work that you're doing or the things that you're learning about via maybe talking on the internet about it or writing about it. How do you apply this with your daughter? And especially how do you think about it as she grows up? Because at eight, I mean, correct me if I'm like, you might think that she should be writing on the internet about the things that she's learning about. I'm guessing you don't feel that way about an eight year old. Uh, maybe you do, I don't know. But like, as she gets older, like, how do you think about what this application should look like in process? Or what, you know, as parents are thinking about it, like maybe on more of a meta level, if a, if a parent has a middle schooler who's really interested in Leonardo da Vinci and is reading about him a bunch, should they be writing about it too? Should they be publishing it somewhere? Like, what do you feel like? And I don't know how concrete how concretely you have hypotheses about this, but I'd love to dig into the application of this a little bit more, like what, what you feel like this should look like in practice, not just for kids, you know, retaining the information that they're learning, but even on a more meta level, like establishing the habits of learning that they're going to carry with them into adulthood. Cause that's a huge part of what childhood education is about is teaching kids how to learn as a process that carries on throughout a lifetime, which generally speaking, I think we're really bad at, but which is one of the most important parts of educating a kid. Yeah. And, and again, you know, I have an N of one and my daughter's eight. So, you know, if she ends up like being a <laughs> serial killer, in, if she ends up being a serial killer in 10 years and somebody wants to listen to this podcast and then cancel me, like go right ahead. We have no idea how this experiment is <laughs> going to turn out. Right. Like no clue, huge disclaimer, no idea. And actually it's like parenting. It's funny. My, my friend, Grace Harry, uh, I was about to publish a great book on joy, actually. She's somebody you should talk to because she has a lot of thoughts on education. Um, uh, she says, you know, parenting is the only job where the training you get is all on the job training. Like nobody, nobody actually knows what they're doing. You kind of are winging it all the time. Um, so one of the projects that we're, my daughter and I have talked about that we're about to embark on is I'm going to have her actually create a podcast, I think. Um, I'm going to have her interview gymnasts who are older who, because she's really into gymnastics, and I was like, oh, okay, well, it's not that hard to get to gymnasts, and they'll, like, love talking to you, because you'll have, like, 10 questions or whatever, and we'll do a whole thing, and mm -hmm. then you'll publish, and you'll start to do it, and she's familiar with the language of TikTok, more familiar than me, she's more familiar with the language of YouTube than I am, she has, she refers to YouTubers she loves, right, and if you do that within reason, you're careful about what they see, then it's actually a great platform to show kids that they can, that the distance between an idea to a creation is very narrow, and that the beautiful thing about the world they live in is that the there's almost no gap between a concept that they might have and a thing that they want to make. And by the way, it's not just like uh, media, digital media. I have friends who have invested in 3D printers for their kids so that they can go and just like 3D print whatever comes to mind, right? Um, and, and I think that's like a very human instinct, but we ha now have tools that make it far, far easier. Here's the challenge. And here's what happens on a lot of these podcasts that I, I find that, that sometimes frustrates me. What non-parents sometimes miss 
is just how freaking tired parents are all the time. <laughs> and, and so I have to freely admit that I do this when I'm on my good days, when the mm-hmm. caffeine level's right, when, when <laughs> there's time and there's energy. But sometimes as a parent, you just want them to stop asking you questions and you just want them to like watch some TV for an hour because you're exhausted and you, you have way too much going on or you, you can't do it that day. So I don't want to make it seem like 24 hours a day, seven days a week at the Sony household, there's like constant creative work. No, like it's like, you know, we watch our share of Harry Potter movies too, but there's a, there's a rhythm that I've tried to establish at least in the mornings with her, where the mornings are devoted to creative work. And what, what that, and that can be anything. And I'll often use the language, I'll tell her, in the mornings, I want us to create things. I'll just say that. And I'll be like, you can, like, we could go out and pick rocks and leaves and make a collage. We could put paint and something together, or we could build a diorama. Like, it could be anything. I just want some of that time in the morning to be devoted to that. Because what I, the habit I'm trying to teach her is the gap, or the, 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 the frame of mind is there is not much of a gap between your idea and your creation. And if you can close that gap and you close it aggressively, like, that's Elon Musk. You know, it's like that. That's entrepreneurship. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's. It literally is a. I have a thought and I have a thing, and I. Like the whole world operates on the principle of closing the gap between the thought and the thing, and so I'm trying to teach her that just through the language of we're going to make things. I would, I would. Um, the the other part of this that that works really really well is kids naturally want to create in groups. At least many of the kids I know and that my daughter is friends with, and so. I, let a, I leave a lot of leverage and a lot of room for group creations. Because if you think about what that does, like there's going to, all the things that she would be learning or like for a test, my daughter's kind of going to either have AI or calculators or a computer, right? It's kind of like mostly useless. Like honestly, like a lot of it, like stuff that's going to be taught for on a test, it's not going to matter. Getting along with members of your species when you're trying to make something is exquisitely hard. It is insanely hard. And I say this is somebody who mostly works on my own on stuff, and it's hard for me to deal with even like people who are not colleagues in the traditional sense, right? And so part of what I'm trying to get her to understand is like, if you create things in groups, you're going to learn about leadership and blah, 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 blah. I would say a final thought that that actually came to mind this morning because of something Tyler Cow- Cowan shared on his blog, which is a paper that uh, evaluated the success of student athletes from colleges is I think sports are are c- competing and participating in like middle school, high school, and college sports. I think is going to be more important than ever in an age where so many things are going to be handled for us digitally. Because I think you are going to have to learn all the skills of influence, of persuasion, of leadership, of leading by example, of grit, of ten- all these characterological things. I think sports are going to be. Like people shouldn't underrate them. They should overrate them. And like my daughter's gymnastics education is the best best thing I can think of for her to go from insight, you know, change behavior, improvement, right? So it's like insight, changing behavior and improvement happens in sports in a very organic way. And so I have like obviously you know, taken time and energy to do that with her. But but to my mind, that those are some of the things that I'm trying to do. It's, it will take root and branch reforms for schools to get to a place where they're doing this. I am massively in favor of those root and branch reforms. I know that many people are not, but, and so I think what I've done, because I can't wave a magic wand and change the school system to my heart's, you know, to my heart's content, is I've tried to build this into my home life. And I've tried to figure out, okay, how, how do I speak in a way and act in a way that you see this too? And so I think one of the things that I've done is, I publish books. She sees that I go from idea to finished product, and she knows that I do this goofy thing, right? And I try to explain it to her along the way. I, it, you know, most parents who are older will tell you this: that the kids basically don't hear anything, any of your words, past the age of like ten or eleven. And so the best thing you can do is just li- like live by example, and and parent by example. And so that is a big part of what I try to do too: is just recognizing like I have to I have to clue her into my work. I have to clue her into cover design decisions and editorial decisions and why I wake up early and how I write and all that stuff. And that's seeping in somewhere. Um, and she'll watch it and see it happen. But to me, it's it's it there's a there's a language around this that kids are very familiar with. They want to create. We just get in the way. It, we really do get in the way. We 
do. And they're they're hardwired for it. And I think your point about the home life is really important. I think a lot of people who aren't in positions to pull their kids out of traditional education for whatever reason, there's so much that you can do in the arena of instilling habits and just modeling for your kids the behaviors that you want them to have, which you're actively doing because you get up every morning and you write and you research and you're working on these books and you're you're showing her by doing that this is a way of being that is one can be consistent with and that one can can reap rewards from and one can make a living doing and one can live a very purposeful and, and meaningful life doing. And that's all so important to show kids. Like when I talk to parents who want their kids to read, I'm like, well, are you reading in front of them? Like, are, you, right. are you modeling this? Yeah. Like, I also want to ask you because you're an author, I can't not ask you, I assume you want to raise an avid reader. How are you thinking about that in the age again, where there are so many pulls on people's attention, especially kids. It's so easy to get lost on TikTok scrolling or watching YouTube videos. Like there's a million different things kids can do. How are you thinking about encouraging your daughter to read? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, <laughs> it's a tough one. No, I mean, look, it's it's. So I just keep a lot of books around. Like mm -hmm. so like table stakes is just having a lot of books around. The second is, I don't. I'm. I don't give her. An unlimited budget, but I've basically said if there's a book you want to buy, we're gonna buy it. And like, and particularly like series. And I actually don't try to steer her reading at all. I let her follow her natural drift, right? To sort of use, I think it's like the Paul Graham essay about following your natural drift. I let her follow her natural reading drift, which is literally anything you want to read, I'm gonna buy a book for it. Like anything. And and that way she's picking up stuff that she actually wants to like enjoy and engage in. And we all have had that experience where there's books that we read because they feel like eating your vegetables and there's books that we read because we're like deliciously engaged with it and it's wonderful and it's so fun. I want her to have that experience at least early on so that she knows that reading is an enjoyable thing. Um, her school mandates a certain amount of reading every night. So we have like that's that. And by the way, that's a time when I read alongside her. So she'll sit on one corner of the couch. I'll sit on the other corner of the couch and we'll read against that timer and what's been nice to watch is that the timer will go off and she'll keep reading, right? So there's a little bit of just that discipline. And then I also, um, I encourage her to, like we read every night before she goes to bed. We're just like, it's like a big part of our lives. And then I don't have for her a specific iPad or like that, like to digital technology is kind of limited anyway, because I want to keep that at bay for as long as, as long as I can keep those barbarians at the gate, I'm going to, you know, eventually they'll get through, but uh, it's like, I've got to do it what I can. Um, but it's hard. It's, it's the hardest thing. I mean, it's like one of those, the, the, the problem is that the temptations are infinite. You can't always get it right. But a few tweaks here and there and letting kids pick their own literature and like pick whatever they want to read, it actually makes a, a monumental difference. I'm, I'm probably also not doing the best job I could of it, to be honest. Like it, you know, I'm as susceptible as anybody. I'm on my phone all the time and she sees these habits, but I am also like always talking to her about books and always pulling out a book and reading and looking and trying to do that. Um, the other, the other thing is I've actually encouraged her to start writing books. And so she does like paper books. So we, a lot of what we do in the mornings is she'll just like force me to staple like 15 pieces of paper together, fold them together, and then we'll both do books. This is like a thing we do like maybe once or twice a week. And I have to do it with her. So I'm drawing like crappy stick figures and like making like, like these things. And she's super excited about this because she's engaged in the process of creating it. And so then it becomes a new thing. It's almost sort of going back to our conversation about projects. That I find is also really helpful. Um, I've had, you know, one creative idea that I haven't tried is I have friends who listen to audiobooks that are age appropriate with their kids in the car when they're driving. I haven't done that just because we don't drive a lot in New York, but I think that could actually work really, really, really well. Um, but mostly what I focus on is I've, I've basically said to her, anytime you want to buy a book, I'm game. Anytime you want to go to a bookstore, I'm game and you can get whatever you want. And, and then you could just apply, you know, if, if, if finances are an issue, you could just say the library. Like my parents, for my parents, that was the library. We would just go to the library all the time get as many books as we wanted, heart's content. You felt like you were in a candy store, right? Like at a certain point, you're just like, really? I can take out anything? And so that that encourages, but I'm not, I, I think they just have to learn to love the act of reading. So let them read comics, let them read anything. I mean, you know, it's, it, you got, I, I think people may be a little bit too prescriptive about this. I don't need her to read how to win friends and influence people at the age of eight. <laughs> do you think it's all about the quality of the reading materials though? Like you just mentioned reading comics. Like, do you have, 
some sense of like some books being more valuable than others and and maybe encouraging by example in a specific direction? Or are you truly agnostic about the material? For the material that I choose to read to her before bedtime, I'm very specific about what I'm reading. Like I read it through before I read it to her and I know exactly what's in it because I don't want her to learn a bunch of bad stuff. For the material that she's reading, I'll do a spot check to make sure it's not crazy. And But otherwise, it's mostly series, like fantasy series, which I grew up reading fantasy series. So I'm like, oh, that's great. Like, I'm, I'm really glad that you like that. And I think, you know, age appropriateness is probably a good marker. But the muscle of reading is such a hard thing to get anyway mm -hmm. that I try not to be too precious about what she's reading. Like, honestly, it's just about flipping the pages and reading the book and not having it be on a screen. Because if she's not, like, that's a win. A win is there's no screen, it's media, it's paper, she's flipping pages and learning something. I, I you know, you can, only, you can only go so far with the rules and regs. Mm-hmm. So you started a pod school for a while during the pandemic with your daughter. I want to talk about this. I have so many questions for you about how you approach this. You clearly have a lot of hypotheses about what education ought to be. Uh, tell me about your experience starting this school. Yeah, no, it was the it was the single most interesting and important insight I got into education, like, you know, in my own and my daughter's and everything included. So it was like a, the, the single most valuable thing that I did that sort of taught me about everything. So take a step back. It wasn't me on my own. Um, I, it was like, what, March, April of 2020. My daughter was in a public pre-K in New York. And by the way, I'll get pretty specific about the details because I imagine a lot of people listening are walking down this road and probably mm -hmm. are where I was, which is thought this was possible, didn't think they'd have the wherewithal to do it, figuring it out along the way. So I'm happy to get as specific as you want, Hannah. Like it's not, no, nothing's closed off here, except for you know, privacy of the individual, some of the individuals involved. Right. Um, it's March, April of 2020. And the, the, the public schools in New York are like, they're open and they're being wildly optimistic about their ability to stay open in the fall, right? Like, like it's like, oh, everything's going to be fine. We'll be back. And I'm like, there's no way you're going to be like, this is going to get so bad. You have no idea. <laughs> and, you know, because I'm like on Twitter and like, it's like, I'm like, oh, this is the viral math is not good math for the school staying open. Like this is, you know. Um, so I started to, at that point, the idea had incepted in my head, like, wait, she's going to have to go to a school where they're gonna have to learn via iPads? Like, I don't even own an iPad, this is horrible. <laughs> I'm not doing this. So that early, like in the next couple months, I, I knew I had a friend who lived about a mile down the road. He was an entrepreneur and he had taught his daughter in a kind of homeschool pod, even like before it was fashionable, like before it was cool, you know, before it was written about in the New York Times and all these Brooklyn families are doing it. Um, and so, so I contacted my friend, his name is Tarek, and I said, Tarek, look, I know you did this. I don't know that I have much to offer other than I would like to do it with you. And I could give up my apartment during the day for a year. And that'll be my like ante at the table is we can retrofit parts of my apartment to make it more school-ish. And then you can like help me with the, how do you find a teacher? How do you organize the parents? What are the rules? Blah, 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 blah. How does all this work? And he, he, he basically was like, when we had our first phone call, he was like, well, you just solved the hardest part of this, which is space. He's like, you'd be surprised, but actually the hardest part of doing this is finding the space. And he said, because it's damn near impossible for people, particularly if they're working from home, to get to give up their space or whatever. And I was like, look, I'll figure it out. I just need a school. <laughs> like I need a school that's not gonna be teaching through iPad. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that we got together a cluster of, uh, was it six families? and they were varying age ranges, and they were like, you know, friends or neighbors or anything. And that was kind of step one, was finding people who'd want to do this because it made the economics work for us hiring a, a teacher. The other part of it that I just alluded to is we actually, this is funny, we put up an ad on Craigslist. And we put up an ad on Craigslist and said, are there any teachers who would be interested in working together with us to create a pod school? This was all over the summer. And, you know, two parents handled the, like, intake. So they would, like, have all these Craigslist responses with resumes and stuff. They would do pre-screen interviews. And then the teachers would be interviewed by the whole group of parents. And then I think for two or three of the teachers, we did, like, a trial lesson before the school year started during the summer. So we would set up all the kids in my, in my place. 
We'd have the teacher come in, we'd see how they were. And we found this incredible person who had the same experience that other people do. She didn't want to be in the public school system that year because it was going to be a chaotic mess. But she also didn't want to stop teaching and she wanted to make a living. And she was more than happy to like roll with it and experiment with us and do this. And so that was what gave rise to this. And I, by the way, my experience here is not unique. Plenty of people do this. Like again, by the time the New York Times is writing about it as a trend, it might have jumped the shark. <laughs> like it's like, you know. Um, but it was hugely illuminating because we eliminated all the bureaucracy of public education. We had one teacher, we had six kids, and we had a year where we were basically allowed to write the rule book. So in a year in which kids weren't able to even go into classrooms, we went on field trips. We did the kids did a kindness week. We took them to the, you know, we did all sorts of stuff that every, if, if a parent had an idea, they could just raise it and bring it to the teacher and we would like activate it. Now, the other side of this that I think is important for parents who are thinking about it, we also, you know, we we weren't, it wasn't ultimately like a radical reinterpretation of, you know, everything that school is from, from bottom to top. We had a teacher. We had a start time. We had an end time. They would come in. They would take off their jackets and their thing. There was like classical music playing. They would sit down. They would do like morning circle or whatever it was called. And I should probably know more about this. <laughs> I mean, you know. It was in your house. Um, right, exactly. Um, but I mean, actually, here's something important. I left before uh, the school started to create a separation between my daughter's home life, me, and my daughter's school life the teacher and her classmates, I would never, I would always leave by 8.30. Uh, because if I was there, it threw off the dynamic. And it was actually really important for me, both for me and for the teacher, that this space be her own. It's my living room, yes, but during between the hours of 8.30 and 3, it's a classroom. And that means something different. And if I'm around, like puttering around, like, I don't know, like using an air fryer, you know, it's like, what? that's a terrible, that'd be a horrible experience, right? For, every, for everybody involved, myself included. And so... We, we, we had a teacher, we had, we had, she had a curriculum that she was roughly hewing to. So it wasn't some like, you know, it wasn't like Rabindranath Tagore's like Indian experiment with like reimagining what education would be. And they were sitting outside in front of trees and stuff. We were inside, like we had fold away tables and, and things, but we had a lot more flexibility to play around with what education could be. And I mean, it taught me so much and it was such a wonderful experience through and through it was wonderful for the teacher. It was wonderful for the parents. It was wonderful for the kids. And it just blew up everything I thought about education. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's told you that. Though. I mean, this is like, you're, you grew up like, I mean, I'm sure you grew up in models like this and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, grew, I grew up homeschooled. So right. I grew up on like the far end of the spectrum ah. doing, you know, well, not, not actually the far end of the spectrum. The far end of the spectrum is true unschooling. And I, there were unschooling elements to my education, but it wasn't purely unschooling. But yeah, it's to me, these things are not radical at all. But to the average person, it's such a wild deviation from the norm that these stories become really, really interesting. But that's actually why I think more people need to share their stories about this and go into the details. So I'll give you another like detail that, that's helpful. Um, you know, you can look at what an average teacher makes in your area, divide that by the number of families you would need to make that salary or higher, and generally it will cost less than private school. I'm like, oh, yeah. full stop. Like, by like you lot. could just, yeah, by a lot. Like you could just do the math and you could have a one-on-six or a one-on-seven classroom setting where the teacher could actually come out financially ahead, right? Mm -hmm. And there are even new ways to like figure out everything from health insurance to we signed contracts so that if a parent dropped out, there was a certain number of like of payments were required. You know, we had independent contractor things. We had a couple lawyers in the group, so they helped us navigate some of this. But it's not mm -hmm. that hard to figure out on your own. No. Um, the Scandinavians do incredible things with fold-away furniture for anybody who's worried about their apartment. Like I, like it literally, I mean, my apartment looked different, but it did not look like a school when I returned. Things were put away and everything disappeared. It was like a totally different place, right? And so there's all these ways in which like getting into the tactics of how this happens, you know, it really for us was not some, it was a Craigslist ad and six families and it was elbow grease and some parents being willing to build some Ikea furniture on the weekends. Like this was not some, um, her, it was it was a lot of work in at the beginning, but as soon as the teacher took over, it was like normal education that people are accustomed to from the public school system. 
And even just what you described, all the furniture was tucked away and it was all disassembled when you'd come back at the end of the day. Even that is such a cool set of lessons for kids, a level of responsibility about the the organization and maintenance of their school that I think a lot of different alternative models work into their approach. And it's really cool, but public school doesn't really have the space for that. The level of, of attention and care that the kids are learning, like we have to, you know, rearrange everything at the end of the day and put everything away. And it's like all cleaned up and tidy. And now school is done. It gives you the psychological separation of like, okay, things aren't out anymore. Like it's not school time. But it's also such a cool set of habits around responsibility for the kids to be learning. But also to your point about the teacher potentially even coming out ahead, there are, I talked to so many teachers who are mm. dissatisfied with the system and they've either already left or they're plotting their exit. They're trying to figure out how to go. And there are so many opportunities with a little bit of entrepreneurial thinking. There are, you know, sure you're leaving benefits behind, but at the same time, there are all kinds of, if you start to think entrepreneurially about like, okay, I'm going to set myself up as an LLC and I'm going to have her like an S corp as a, with a, myself as the sole employee. And I'm going to, you know, there are all kinds of things that the teachers can do too yeah. to set themselves up where they actually have some really cool advantages going out on their own that sound really intimidating if you don't know anything about how like the legal formation of an LLC works, but it's really simple. There are services that'll walk you through it and t teach you every step, everything that you need to know. Uh, as I'm talking about this, somebody should build this, like resources for teachers on how to exit the system and set yourself up as like a sole proprietor. No, Hannah, I think this is like your calling. <laughs> I mean, I think this is, this is the, like, you're the perfect person for this. But I would say also, for those who are even intimidated by that process, you could just be a 1099 contractor and the IRS will understand. Like plenty of people are 1099 yeah. contractors. The other thing is we paid a premium, again, because I take it that there may be parents listening who are intimidated by this. Just know, oh, yeah. I like just, just full disclosure, I am a product of like suburban Chicago public education. Like I went to a traditional, I went to Duke University. I am very much a product, a byproduct of that system. And I would argue that the pandemic year education that my daughter had in the pod school is probably the best education she's ever going to get. Um, because, and I would say that the biggest driving factor was she had one, she had five uh, fellow girls together with one teacher, so six students, one teacher, and it the entire experience was about like, you know, 10 standard deviations calmer than the average classroom with 27 kids of varying kind of things and that, no attention being paid from anybody, right? And that's not, by the way, a fault of the teachers. It's a fault of, I don't know, more, more thoughtful people than I know why that happens the way it does. But I feel for teachers, especially after seeing how much one-on-one -on -one time a teacher can get when they're in your home and you can get one-on-six, you know, like, like they really dive in with students create little mini projects that three and three can do together, right? Have flexibility so that parents can lead field trips. Let me give you an example of how flexible you can be in this kind of format. There was a day that winter, the winter of 2020, where there's a really, really, really bad storm in New York, a ton of snow. I mean, like it came down in sheets. And I still remember this. There was a debate on the parent and teacher text messaging on iMessage should we keep our schools open because the public schools are closed? Naturally, all the parents are like, I gotta get these kids out of my house, <laughs> right? Like, they need to get the hell out of my house. You know, in a, in a gentle, you know, I'm half joking. But mm -hmm. one of the parents said, look, I have a, a SUV that seats eight. What I'll do is I'll drive to the teacher's home, I'll drive to everybody's house, I'll get everybody and I'll bring them to Jimmy's. And if we start a half hour late, at least they still had a school day that they got to do. And that's exactly what happened. So even on a day when the schools were closed, because of that kind of flexibility, we were able to have school. They had a great day. It was, and they didn't know that the other kids were having snow days, which was really also part of the part of this is just like you know, veil of, rolls and veil of ignorance. If you don't know there's a snow day, there's no snow day for you. Uh, <laughs> and so, so there's there's a, there's a kind of power in that that I I saw where we were able to craft the experience in a way that responded to what was a really genuinely hard year for parents. I mean. I, I know there's no parents I know who didn't emerge from that period with scars. Like, especially if you have young kids under the age of 10, the pandemic was really, really, really tough. And my, my heart goes out to, to <laughs> my heart goes out to basically anybody who had to parent during that time because it was brutal. The only thing is like activities were shut down. You just, you didn't know, we didn't know so much early on. So you, everything you did was tentative. You're like, should I take them to the park or is the park going to be where they go to die? You know, it's like, it's a lot of like questions you couldn't answer, but 
I would argue that in doing the pod school, I just saw the dramatic effect of like small class sizes, self-directed learning, a teacher that was willing to like play around with the curriculum, more parent and teacher engagement, because there's no principal, there's no administration, there's no New York Department of Public Schools. It's you, five, like, you know, five other families, and the teacher sorting things out. Is this a book appropriate? Is it not appropriate? How do people feel about this? How do people feel about that? Now, that's not always the easiest process, but what, what an amazing thing to show kids that like parents can actually get together and do this. And I will tell you, on the last day, I, I could go, by the way, Hannah, I could talk about this forever and ever. It's so fun for me to talk about. You know but I, I don't, could too. <laughs> yeah. On the last day of like our graduation ceremony, we had this, uh, one of the parents was really intrepid and they found a company to take all the photos from the year and put it to song and like it looks really beautiful and you pay a little bit of money and it looks amazing. There wasn't a dry eye at our, like it was so moving because it was such an, like when you looked at the totality of all the things these girls did during this year, it was amazing. And what I, what I suppose I can offer to parents who are listening is that none of us were billionaires. You know, none of us like, this was all done. These were, everybody in that group was a working parent. Everybody had other obligations or responsibilities. We didn't live in palaces. This was my living room, you know, and a few hundred square feet, a teacher we found through Craigslist and a little bit of elbow grease. This was, we didn't have a tech platform. There was nothing fancy. It was simple techniques, but solving these discrete problems. And as soon as these problems fell into place or were solved, things fell into place for the school. Did you have, when you were hiring a teacher, did you have some sense of what you wanted a curriculum to look like or what you wanted the educational approach to look like? Were you trying to follow as much as possible what the kids would have been doing in public school had they stayed enrolled and just kind of like fill the gaps before they went back to school? Or did you have some hypotheses around, like we want more of a project-based types of type of education or we want more, like we want a teacher with some Montessori influence or something like that. How much were you thinking about that in the process of finding the right candidate. Yeah, you're giving me so much credit right now. I totally don't deserve it. No, and it's like, no, not at all. I mean, on, like, no, and I should be honest because I mean, parents listening, like, should hear this. I had, we didn't, I, I had no clue what I was doing, right? And neither did any of the other parents. And I think that should be reassuring for parents to hear. Um, I don't know anything about, I mean, I know some of this stuff just because I've read it for fun, but I didn't have any grand theories of education. We did want somebody that had teaching experience. <laughs> that, was, that was a prerequisite. Like a, a pulse would be nice, you know, <laughs> like a, a face, a face, a pulse, use of their limbs. Like, no, I mean, but I'm joking, but not Honestly, not by that. Like, it's like more like what we wanted was somebody that had teaching experience. We wanted somebody that actually came. All the interviews, we would ask questions about curriculum. But but the funny thing is like we'd do the debriefs after. And it's not like the parents had any well-formed thoughts on what the curriculum should be. It was just useful to see a candidate show up with something. This particular candidate that we ended up hiring did show up with something. And so she had a thought. Now, we also had – it was – pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade all meshed together. So there were at least, there was like a, at least a bracket in age that was pretty close. Um, it worked for us. Maybe there are other ways to do it. I think multi-generational education can be really interesting when you're, everybody's lumped together. Um, there may be pros and cons there. I don't know about those things. But for us, the ages were pretty tightly in range. And so for us, like the curriculum, as long as the teacher felt like the curriculum could be adapted for each student, we were good. But it wasn't, we had no... It was about constructing something that wasn't going to be iPad education, and basically anything else was just gravy. It was like, if we've got the rudiments of a classroom that don't involve electronics, we're in a good spot. Um, you know, if I had to go back over again, I'm sure I would do more of that. But here's, here's one other. Actually, this is, this is the important point that comes out of your question. I think that it was really important that we gave the teacher a huge amount of autonomy. That, that, that actually, like, and actually, I remember talking to Tarek, I'm going to, I'm going to admit something that, that, that came up during the, the planning for this pod school, because you can imagine that it's not always the easiest thing to navigate. And, you know, you've got families and you've got expectations. And I said, I was like, Tarek, the only thing you and I need to do is get to the first day of school. If we can get to the first day of school, all of these very busy working parents are gonna drop their kids off and feel an enormous amount of relief. And then we can let our teacher, Miss Andrea, run with it and just do what she does so well. 
And I said, that's all we got to do. I said, every argument, every this, that, the other, what are our masking policies, vaccination, all. I said, dude, we just need to get to the first day of school and we'll be fine. And part of that was motivated by a belief that I think if you, if you give a teacher who loves to teach autonomy, they are doing the thing they're called to do. And so it's to me, I would have been insulting to prescribe what that thing should be outside of, you know, like a few things maybe at the margins. But even I don't I don't think I once voted or said, oh, I think we should do this and not this. I think there was like one book that there was some like a minute, little bit of, hey, are we, do we feel like this is age appropriate? But that was about it. Otherwise, the the autonomy given to the teacher, I think, is one of the gifts of, for teachers of doing things like this because you actually get back to the work you're there to do, right? Again, I doubt I'm the only person to say this. I actually feel somewhat self-conscious talking about this on your podcast because I'm sure you've thought about this way more than I have. But to me, one of the things that's lost in the equation are not just the economics, not just how good it is for kids, but autonomy to build a curriculum that's better designed for your students. I can't imagine public schools get away with that in the way that they, in the way that we could. Yeah, I think... I'm such a huge advocate for the small localized pod schools, micro schools, all those types of things, as you well know, because they give so much room both for the individual actually delivering the education to have autonomy, which is really important because then they can do what they're actually, they can be adapting to the actual situation that's in front of them, not trying to force the situation that's in front of them to fit inside of some broad systems, narrow set of definitions around what a kid's supposed to be doing or what a classroom is supposed to be accomplishing. They can look at the children in front of them and say, okay, this is the very specific set of needs. We have these like special needs over here. We have these set of interests over here. We have this one kid that just like really can't sit still, but like we can adapt to that if we have the flexibility to build an education around the very specific group of individuals that are present, but also it gives, it puts all of the accountability and also the locus of control. It returns it to the local, which is where it should Mm. be. Like the teacher was accountable to the parents. The parents needed to make sure that they felt like their kids were getting an appropriate education. And and that's infinitely more, if the parents care, that's infinitely more effective than some state board of education you know, having a set of, well, these are the test scores that you were supposed to have gotten. And so we're trying to like figure out how do we, how do we measure huge numbers of individuals in a way that's standardized and the best we've been able to come up with is test scores, which is really sad. Uh, But like it brings it all back to the things that actually matter. And I think that's so cool. So I love hearing stories about people who are you know, putting this into practice in different ways. And the story of what you did is really cool. And I think it's, I'm, I'm really glad that you're super open about sharing this because it's yeah. such an important thing for parents to hear about. Cause so many people I think get stuck in the part of the process that you're describing where you're in the early stages of this, you want to do it, but the hurdles of going from zero to one idea to execution is so challenging. And so hearing people talk about that is so important. I was curious were, when you did your homeschooling, did you did your parents teach you or was it a teacher or was it a mix of different techniques and people and experiences it was a mix so in elementary school my mom was my primary teacher my dad mm. did math um and then we were part of a homeschool co-op that would get together one day a week and do classes with hired teachers on specialized topics. So we did, we'd always go to the county park in the mornings and we mm. contracted the naturalists there for years to teach classes. And they would do, you know, science stuff. So everything from like, we did one like food chemistry semester Mm. once where we made candy and stuff and it was super interesting. Um, And we'd learn about like the, we'd, we'd like go out in the woods and learn about tracking and plant identification and shelter building and all kinds of like nature school type things like that, that were really awesome. Um, we do animal dissections and learn about like edible bugs and all kinds of weird, <laughs> weird things. It was great. And then we'd have like a, a Spanish teacher and a drama teacher and like things like that, that, you know, one parent probably didn't want to pay for. But when you lump all the resources together and teach as a group, it becomes really cost effective. Yep. Um, like, I don't remember the exact numbers of how much the different classes cost, but it was not a lot when you mm. hire a teacher once a week and then 
you have like 10 kids in the class or 20 kids or whatever. Um, So we do that. And then when I was in middle school and high school, we pivoted from doing like primarily like books and like hands-on stuff that my mom could teach to, I started watching recorded video lectures from like the teaching company, The Great Courses. Like all of my high school was just binge watching The Great Courses. Wow. It was the best. That's why I didn't go to college is because I was getting the best professor on every topic sitting like on my couch and then the thought of having to go choose one school that had one of those people that I loved. Mm. And then I just have to take, you know, like gen ed requirements for all of the other topics. And it, it just felt so, I felt like such a step backwards after having that experience. It totally ruined me for traditional <laughs> education. Um, but my parents were able to outsource all this. stuff. like my mom couldn't have taught a whole lecture series on medieval literature or right. whatever. But I was able to go watch all of this stuff. And then my parents were more like the facilitators, making sure I had all the mm-hmm. resources that I needed. Um, and people, people do it in tons of different ways. I grew up in a fairly rural area. There was like, it was a long drive to get to a place that had classes. It's expensive mm. to start putting in both the miles and also paying for all these different courses and stuff. So we just like used the library system and stuff yeah. to find even great courses at the library. It's amazing. You can watch right. them all for free. It's the coolest thing. Um and then how did how were and then how were you test like were you tested or how did how did how was the <laughs> what was the gap between well <laughs> that's a knowing laugh um, <laughs> did you what 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 made it more than like did how did you retain information or what was the output was there an output or anything like that yeah that's a this is a really good full, full circle of the conversation that we were having right. earlier um so I grew up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a little more rigid with like the state standards for testing. Mm. So I had to take a state standardized test in third, fifth and eighth grade. That was just like a sort of a benchmark. Um, my parents weren't testing me at all. Those were mm. until I took the PSAT and the SAT. Those were literally like the only timed tests I had ever taken. Wow. Um, and I went when I went and took the, the, the SAT, it was the weirdest experience because I went into a school and like you're in a classroom with a bunch of people and you're all taking this test. And the whole time I'm just like the homeschooler in the middle of the room <laughs> looking everywhere, trying to figure out it's like, do people do you all do this often? Like, is this? It's hilarious. You're like, is there a video accompaniment? Is it, I'm sorry, is there a screen? (laughs) It was so, it was so trippy to me to be, I was like, so so this is normal for you all. Like this is, this is such a, so peril, so so counter to how my world works, Uh, which in and of itself was fascinating to get Mm. to like see it from the inside after being so far outside. But yeah, my parents were not were not testing me or anything. There was a lot of application of the things that I was learning in, but it was pretty self-directed. So when I was in um, elementary school, we mm. had a really Waldorf-inspired oh. education. So we were doing, when you were talking about the books earlier, that was very similar to what I would do. We had these lesson books that we would buy from the Waldorf school stores where, I don't know if you've ever seen these, but it's no, like- it's, so it's, they're these really beautiful, they have like a bright colored cover huh. uh, that you can get them in different sizes. So you can get like small like books and then like bigger books and they're all blank pages. And then there's onion skin paper in between each ah. page to like protect them from smudging. And then Waldorf schools also use crayons made out of beeswax. So we got a bunch wow. of those. They're like, they smell good. They <laughs> feel good. The colors are so smooth. They're beautiful. The whole thing is this delightful sensory experience. So we would make lessons. Of- <laughs> here, I, here I am like using like used Crayola. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, I got to set my game up. Like this is crazy. Well, let me be clear. <laughs> let me be really clear. Uh, that was like an added bonus feature that was really cool. It is not a necessity for right. delivering this. Right, 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 right. Uh, my parents just thought it was really lovely and wanted to invest in these things because they'd found them and thought that like it aligned with the values of how they wanted me to be interacting with these mm-hmm. things. They wanted to instill a value for beautiful things and quality mm. things and like natural materials and all of that. Like they were really sold on that premise. It is not necessary. Like mm-hmm. you can use used Crayola crayons and scrap right. paper, like from the back of the bills that you get in the mail. And like, you can have, you can do the same thing. You yeah. don't need fancy materials at all. Right. Um, but anyway, we would make these lesson books. So like basically like when you're learning about a topic, so one of the ones that we did was Norse mythology. We studied mm. Norse mythology when I was in elementary school. And so I would like, we'd read all the myths and learn about it. And then I would retell them. So I would like write out my oh. version of the myth. And then I would do an illustration. So like on one side of the page, you have the essay is like a page long. And then you do this whole illustration on the other side, you have the onion skin paper in between to keep it from smudging. Um, 
And so I did a ton of that when I was younger wow. and I was always working on projects and stuff. I was like writing books of my own and, and like working on entrepreneurial projects. And like, I always had some scheme I was concocting. <laughs> so there were like lots of very informal and organic applications of the thing. When I was in high school, I did a lot of writing, hmm. which was the primary application. And then I was always more interested in like the words side of things as opposed to math. So I'd have different projects. Like I started a book club and I had like a literary magazine for a while. And like, I was doing all this stuff in the real world that I just thought was cool. Um, so it was less formalized. Like here's a very specific hmm process that we're following to make sure that Hannah actually remembers everything that she's learning. My parents just kind of, they knew that I would do things because I couldn't help myself. So they just kind of like, let me go do stuff. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. I think, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, like the importance of helping kids find, like build habits mm -hmm. that sustain into adulthood around learning. And obviously it's not, you don't, if you don't get it in your childhood, it's not like you're never going to do it as an adult, which I want to talk about this in a second with your experience because you came from such a different mm -hmm. world than the one that you're in now. And I want to talk about how you I have so many questions about how you bridge that gap. But I think, you know, my parents wanted to support me in building some of these habits of like being a, a lifelong learner. But I think a lot about you know, what, what is the balance between practical application and just like learn, like instilling the love of learning without it having to be a chore. It's like, if you're curious about something, you can just learn about it. You don't necessarily have to have a thing that you do to check off the, like, this is right. the checklist for how you learn something. You have to like right. go read an article and then like find another source. And then you have to do something with it. Like sometimes you're just curious. Um, so there's like a weird balance. And I think it's really dependent on the individual child's proclivities, like how, where, where that line is between encouraging action versus just encouraging the innate love of learning and making sure that doesn't go away. Um, but yeah, that was, I, I feel like the experience that I had just like sent me down the road of thinking right. about a lot of this because I started to see it in contrast of everything else. And that's what got the gears turning for me of like, wait a second, this is kind of, this is kind of right. different. Yeah. There's like a lot of different ways you can do this. And that's really interesting. Yeah. It, it also, do you have brothers or sisters? One sister, younger. Same style of education? Yeah. Oh, wow. And were you, were you taught together, like as a, as a pair? We, there's a six year age gap. Okay. So no. Okay. Uh, I was very much the experiment kid. Uh, <laughs> and then my sister got to reap all the benefits of what we learned from, <laughs> from me. <laughs> got it. And I think, I think in what we just described, think about what we just described over the last 15 minutes or so is a spectrum like you 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 know of 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 a model that breaks you out of the traditional hierarchy and in my case for a variety of practical reasons it wasn't going to be the case that I could individually homeschool my child but I still knew that that year of public education was not going to be up to par for what I wanted for her and on your mm -hmm. end of the spectrum it's totally different and I feel like like I hope what people take away is just there's room to maneuver, you know, I and mean, there's a little bit of like you've you've got more, there's more like again, you can go on Craigslist. <laughs> like it's like not this isn't fancy. Uh and it's doable. Um and then at the other end, if you're intrepid and you can, you can do what your parents did, right? And just really go whole hog. Um it it's it to me, that was the biggest, the biggest lesson from the year was basically, oh, like we've we, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Like the educational emperor actually has no clothes. And mm -hmm. a lot of what we think defines education is just like arbitrary. And I don't like quite know why it exists. And that it can look any way that you want it to. And I say this to somebody who's like, whose Indian immigrant parents like forced him to get A's all his life, right? And so from my perspective, I was like a total, I was, I was the poster child for that system. And now I can't wait to explore models and ways of getting out of it because I just, I know that there's a better alternative. Well, I think, I think there are a couple of metaphors that summarize what you just said. I think, so the human eye can only perceive a small band of the range of colors that actually exist or like mm. wavelengths of light. Um, I'm not a scientist, so forgive the slight butchering of the technical terminology, but there's a small range of light that we can see. There's a very large range of light that we cannot. And I think the way there are lots of this, this metaphor applies to how we think about ideas too, except it's not actually a physically limited range. Mm. It's just a range that's limited based on frame of reference and what we know. Like there are, 
uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this. There are cultures that don't have words for spe- mm. specific colors. Yeah. And when you put color charts in front of them, they actually can't discern them. And there's like this weird correlation between we don't have words for this thing and it's also hard to see. And it like starts to beg the questions, well, how much of this is like you actually like physically can't see this versus you've just never thought about the distinction between these two things. And so you see these like different hues of things side by side and you're perceiving them as all lumped into the same thing because you've never actively like looked at them head on and and started to develop the language to discern and like parse out the different pieces and the distinctions here. And I think that spectrum metaphor is really helpful for a lot of the different things that we look at in real in the world that we live in, especially like the human constructs of the world that we live in. We have this very narrow Overton window mm-hmm. of what we think education is. And it's like, okay, there's public school and then there's private school, which is very, very similar to Public, public school, school is just like right. a slightly different hue. And then there's like the charter schools that are kind of in between. And then maybe there's this like weird outlier thing called homeschooling. homeschooling and that's kind of right. it. And in reality, what you're seeing is a very tiny sliver of a very broad spectrum mm. of ways that you can educate a human and help them develop into like a rationally thinking, competent, skilled adult. And I think this is true for a lot of a lot of different things since we've already brought up politics on this episode i suppose <laughs> i can go here again broke the seal um, broke your podcast your seal. Fault. yeah uh, it's, it's gonna get it's gonna get reclosed after this right, episode exactly. maybe i don't know we'll say no promises but uh i remember years ago i read one of ron paul's books where mm. he was talking about how he was like you know becoming a commentator in the libertarian world and he was talking about how most people think about politics is this very narrow spectrum too, where there's like the Republicans and the Democrats and like they see that as being an entire spectrum. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is just like a small piece of all the different philosophies and approaches that are out there. We're just, we also only ever talk about these two things. And therefore we think that is the extent of the spectrum. And we're looking at all the little nuances in Mm. between these two points on what we think is a whole, but really they're just like two finite points on a very broad spectrum of what different like philosophies around what politics ought to be are, what what exists out there. And I think that applies very cleanly to education. And I want to talk a little bit. Um, I don't want to cut you off if you have no. pushback and corrections to no, what I, I just said. No, I, compl- <laughs> I like I couldn't agree more. What I the one the one but, thing I would say is I think the default on education is a lot harder to push. I think I think the I don't think that this is an easy problem or situation to fix. And I think the Overton window is going to stay where it is for a while. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But I will, I will tell you, like, that's, that's something that keeps me up at night is we need a radical rethinking of what education is. And I would bet almost every dollar in my bank account that we're not going to get it. And that's really sad. Like, it's like one of those that it makes me, I mean, in some ways I'm like, well, what can I do? Like my, you're sort of like, what, what? And there are things I could do, and I've sort of done some of those things. We'll probably do more of those things. But to me, it is actually the one of these great things that we know actually that change needs to happen, and we're probably not going to get it. Like it's it's actually really hard, uh, and and the these systems are ossified in a way that I think is really damaging. Well, I I'm I'm going to push back on that just a little mm. bit. I'm I'm chronically optimistic, <laughs> so take what I say with a grain of salt. But I do think. I think that you're, I I both agree and disagree. I agree that we're not going to get it inside of the the constraints of this system that exists. Right. Like there are a lot of things that need to change that won't. There's just too much mass to move to get the thing to change course even a small amount. It's just the, the forces of inertia are so strong here. But as soon as you step outside of the system, Hmm. all of these different options of like what ought to be become possible immediately. And they become possible, not just like there's no barriers to entry, like in terms of restrictions, like you actually could go do the thing, but it's not that hard to start executing. Like you just described, you had no idea what you were doing. You did not plan to start a pod school and then school started shutting down and they got super weird. And you're like, you know what? There's a forcing function now. (laughs) Maybe we're going to try this. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Like they they hit some point Mm -hmm. that has enough it's enough of a forcing function that they say okay we're gonna go try something else and see see what we can do here but i do think that all of the change that we want to see like i think the 
you know, conversation about what innovations need to happen and how we mm. educate more broadly. That's a whole separate conversation. That's that's a, a long series of conversations right. that will be happening on this podcast. People, you should <laughs> right, keep working right. if you're curious. <laughs> um, but uh, check out episode four. No, right, I'm totally right. kidding. Um, but uh, there's, you know, this, that's a separate co- a conversation. Like, okay, we live in this very new world now with, all of these changing dynamics, how do we educate a kid? What types of, like, I mean, when you look at the history of innovation and education, it's not that extensive, really. Mm. We've been doing a lot of the same things for a long time. It's interesting to start digging into. But, you know, the the capacity to innovate and to build these new models, like, I think we're going to see a lot of, like, as people start to experience these different forcing functions that are pushing them out of the system, they can do this innovation. So I think... I agree with your pessimism about change inside of the status quo system, but I do think like if people wanted to leave that and they wanted to go build something better, there's pretty much nothing stopping them except fear really at the end of the day. Like it all boils down to, well, we're afraid we're going to mess up our kids' education or we're afraid that our kid's going to grow up weird and it's going to be our fault or we're afraid that you know, we're not going to be able to make it on a single income or we're afraid that we'll regret like one spouse giving up their career to homeschool or we're afraid that if we put them in this alternative school, it's going to have these other repercussions and like our social, like none of our social network is going to understand and there's mm. going to, it's going to be like a weird set of conversations that we're going to cap, keep having to have forever, you know, whatever it is, like people are afraid of the the negative outcomes of this. But I do think it's, I do think it's possible. But I also, I want to talk, like we could talk about this all, right. all day, but there are a couple other things that I also am dying to ask you. One of which is you grew up inside like the most traditional path possible. You were a great student. You went to a great university. You got a job at a great consulting firm after you graduated. You were on like the total status quo path. Mm -hmm. And yet now you are such an embodiment in so many ways of the alternative path, both you know, in the way that you're educating your own daughter, but also the work that you do, like you're doing what people aspire to be able to do when they go and get an education, but you do it for a living and you do it without, I mean, technically you have people's permission, I guess, because you have publishers who are giving you advances to do the work, but like really you're not sitting around waiting for somebody to give you permission no. to go research something. Like you just become really curious about it. Like you just said, you're going down the rabbit hole on Galileo right, right. now. You're like, well, maybe there's something here. Yeah. You went super down the rabbit hole of the PayPal mafia for years because you were fascinated by it. Um, you've been able to go down rabbit holes and educate yourself in an incredibly self-directed sense of the ter- of of what education is and i want to know how you got there because that's a really mm. interesting narrative arc you went from like one end of the spectrum to the other how did that happen yeah no it's a great question i appreciate it it's like it's funny because you you kind of don't connect the dots until someone else connects the dots for you so i appreciate you saying all that because i'm like oh yeah actually hey that person sounds really interesting oh you know yes um, you should talk to them <laughs> yeah, exactly really hang fun. out with them sometime <laughs> uh swipe right <laughs> Um, and so, so I would, I would say, oh boy, where to start? So the place to start, and this is the, the, the part of it that I have to be sort of ruthlessly honest about is all of the self-directed things that I have done have been done as side hustles. And so that's really key. Like it, it astonishes me the degree to which people think that when I say I've written a book that I like quit my job, moved to Walden Pond and like wrote a book. Like they, they actually believe this. And I'm like, no, that's not how this works. If you want health insurance, <laughs> you know? I'm like, <laughs> like I just did it. I mean, so let me give you a bit of the trajectory, which is when I sort of finished up formal schooling, I went to McKinsey, a top flight consulting firm, you know, sort of natural kind of like feeder, like the Duke's a feeder for as is all, all the other sort of top schools in the country. You go to consulting, you don't know exactly what you're there to consult on, but they tell you it's vaguely prestigious. You will get paid a little bit and you'll be fine. Maybe you can go to business school later. And I loved my colleagues at McKinsey. They were some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. But I couldn't stand the work. It just made no sense to me. I had no experience. Like, what the hell was anybody asking my opinion about on anything? It just made no sense. And so what I did was while I was there, I was like, well, how am I going to break out of this? This is like a system I have to break out of. And so I said, well, what I could do is just start to noodle on book ideas 
and I had an idea for a book about Cato the Younger, who was Julius Caesar's arch nemesis. And I had this buddy of mine who we did done debate together at Duke, and I said, Rob, we should write a book on Cato the Younger because there's no book on Cato the Younger. It's just like, wow, how can there not be a book on Cato the Younger? And he was like, but we're not classicists. Like, what's the? What's, I said, it doesn't matter, right? I was like, we'll write a proposal. If somebody gives us money, we'll do it. It'll be fun. And if we don't, if we don't sell it, it doesn't matter because all we did was like write a proposal. It's not that tough. I mean, we just Google about this stuff. So what we would do is I would have him come to the McKinsey office in DC where we were both living and he would come there like after hours and we would just like use the whiteboard and like use the, re like it's like use the printer and whatever. And we would sit there and like in this conference room, instead of eking out marginal efficiencies in Fortune 500 companies, we were writing about ancient Rome and it was like the best time ever. And we did that a few nights a week until we had a proposal cobbled together, sent out a bunch of letters to agents and we got an agent on the hook, like fortuitously, and that was it. But I didn't quit my day job to do that, right? And I look, at some point, I suspect I will actually not be doing client work or day jobby things while I'm writing my books. I think that's kind of where I'm headed. I have a bunch of ideas that I'm working on. But to, to, it's really critically important for people to understand that you don't actually have to do this like follow your passion nonsense. Your passion can just be the thing you do early in the morning, late at night, or on the weekends while you keep the lights on other ways. Like this is, by the way, it's like a real fallacy that like an artist is only pure if they're not engaged in the work of making a living. It's like, go, go pound sand. Honestly, like you gotta get off the high, people have to get off the high horse on that one because what it does is it limits people's vision of that kind of life. Like, like sure, are there some people where the first book they write is like, like a TikTok hit and now they can just do that all the time? Maybe, but those stories can be counted on generally one or two hands. And it's really dispiriting for other people who might be locked at a Goldman Sachs or who might be locked at some other thing they don't want to do that they're like, well, I can't do that because how am I going to keep the lights on? I can tell you exactly how. You're going to get up at four o'clock in the morning and you're going to work from four to 8 a.m. And then at 8 a.m. you're going to go do your job that you don't like very much. And then after that, you're going to come home and but guess what? You're going to go to bed early because you're going to be really tired. And then you're going to get up at four o'clock in the morning and you're going to do it over again. Uh, for founders, that was the last five and a half years of my life. Every day, seven days a week. Holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever it took. Seven days a week. Saturday, Sunday. My friends still joke about it. You can always contact me between the hours of four and seven o'clock in the morning because I, I'm awake, I'm working. And I do it because it is the thing that I then like pour all this passion into. And then I have other commitments and obligations and a real life and I do the real life stuff. And by the way, the other the other part of this is a fallacy. You even if I had all the time in the world, I I'm like I wouldn't be able to stay focused on one project for 12 hours at a time. Like it's like very few authors I know are actually just authors. They're doing 25 other things. And it's not at all a knock against you if you engage in the real world. Why? Because the real world are your readers. Like if you're engaged in the world, let's say for me, like speech writing, ghost writing, that sort of thing, I'm always like learning about audiences. I'm always learning about like what people are interested in, like what lines work, what jokes work, what doesn't work. That helps my writing and then the writing helps that. You know, Eric Hoffer, a really famous writer, is one of my favorites. Eric Hoffer was a longshoreman. He was a longshoreman philosopher, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it, so I would just, I would just off sound a note in defense of people who might be caught in a trap of thinking that the only way to do a thing is to go get an MFA or to go get a fellowship or to, you know, <laughs> win an emerging ventures grant or to like whatever. It's actually like the best way to do it is just to, to wake up earlier and do it earlier and do it before you do everything else. And it doesn't sound glamorous because it's not. It doesn't sound fun because it's not. And it, it's not fun for a while until it's fun. And then it gets epically, epically, epically fun. And I don't think these stories are told often enough. Like it's just about like doing more. And, and I'm sorry for people who are like anti-hustle culture and stuff. It's like, I don't care. I do this seven days a week and I love it now, but I didn't love it when I was doing it. And other friends of mine were going out on Friday night and I was sitting at home writing about Cato the Younger, right? It's not, <laughs> it's not great for your love life, but it does get you a book and it gets you these incredible experiences. Uh, maybe there's other ways to do it. But I would say that like, I do want to make that point really emphatically that the way I did it was, was just elbow grease and a lot of stubbornness and a lot of just, I'm going to do a thing. And hey, that's by the way, some of my favorite writers, Michael Lewis, like was working at Solomon Brothers and started writing. 
He wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal that got published. The op-ed, he was working at Solomon Brothers, and the op-ed was literally like, bankers get paid too much. And it was like a screed against bankers. The bank like called him in and said, you can't write stuff like this. So he wrote under his mother's maiden name. He wrote under the name Diana Bleeker. So one of my favorite stories is that he wrote under a false name. Michael Lewis, one of the truly great talents of our time, like from a narrative nonfiction perspective, wrote under his mom's maiden name because the bank that he was working at wouldn't let him write. And so I would just say like, you know, you can kind of find a way to go navigate the world. What you, what you also do is if you don't have means, you live below your means. And if you do have means, you just like recognize your extraordinary gift and you just run with it as long as you can go. You know, you just like, that's like a part of it too, is just like learning some basic economics, like, mm-hmm. like learning some really truly just like fin- basic financial literacy can help you stay in the game longer because you can continue to do creative work and creative output. And then another part of it is you find other people who are like you, like you find your weirdos, you know, you find this, these other groups of people who also side hustle and who also do the thing and who also, and I actually have found, this is just me, like, I find that it's useful if your side hustly crazy friends are not in the same industry as you, like, because then the, the subtle, you know, patina of competitiveness goes away. I mean, I have a lot of author friends, don't get me wrong, but like a lot of my favorite friends to riff on, like the economics, time management, self-discipline, uh, anxiety, they are artists, they're startup people. So they have a vague like tie to what I'm doing, but they're not exactly the same. And then once that group of people's around, that's who you can go to to say, hey, like when you were doing your 1099, like what write-offs did you do? You know, like it's like when you first get started with the like mechanics of actually building a life that's more independent, those people can be very, very valuable. Um, but I, that's a little bit of the trajectory was every job I've had, I wrote books on the side and that was it. It's there's not there's, and and I just kept going and going and going until the the work started to to you know become real and almost I would say like I don't know any other way to do it but it worked. It it definitely worked. I was at a I was at Barnes and Noble last week and I was going through the business section and I saw your most recent <laughs> book on the bookshelf. I got really excited. I was like, hey, he's going to be on my podcast in a few days. Um, <laughs> Which I don't, I don't know what makes it more real than that right, having right, exactly. that in the real world. You can go to Barnes and Noble and see it. Like that's that must be so incredibly validating to get to go see your yeah. book at the bookstore. I think <laughs> it must well, be pretty cool. It, it is and it isn't. Here's why: it, it it is in the sense that it's like fun for kind of like a oh your friend will see it and send you a photo and you'll you know you'll do you'll heart <laughs> you'll like hearts thank you. Um, but in reality, like. This is going to, for a lot of authors, they should be very wary of the bookstore trap. Uh, Seth Godin's written a bunch about this. We're like, be really careful in believing that bookstores are where books are sold. Because if you actually care about the economics of books, you know that Amazon is where books are sold. And mm-hmm. the publisher will try to tell you, like, you've got to send out links to bookstores. And it's like, well, no, except that all my friends, like, buy their books on Amazon. That's where we're going. And whether for Audible or for Kindle or for hardcover, uh, it's like Amazon's the world's biggest bookstore. And uh, so I, I'm not knocking bookstore. I love book. Look, I, again, this is my work. It's my field. I love bookstores, but I'm also, people should appreciate that most books are sold somewhere else. And that's okay. There's no problem with that. Um, what I, what I think the deeper satisfaction though, is that the satisfaction question is really important. The deeper satisfaction is the zero to one satisfaction. So it's the, there wasn't a thing and there is now a thing. And for authors, I, I get my thrill knowing that like there was an empty space on the bookshelf and now there is not. And that in any field of endeavor, whether you, like, your podcast, right? Or like in anything you're trying to do, if, if you can find a way to even trick yourself into getting the fulfillment from the creation of the thing, it does make everything else a lot easier, you know? Like it, it, it simplifies it. It takes it down to brass tacks because you're like, well, all I'm trying to do is go from nothing to something and I want the something to be really high quality and I have these standards based on other models I've seen for what that should be. Uh, that's better as a way to measure success than the vanity metrics because, mm-hmm. the, because that just, you get weird and you get, you start writing sequels of yourself. You, and we have this problem in the culture, by the way, that like everything's a freaking sequel, which though, though, I will say this, 2023 has been a banner year for non-sequel things, right? Three of the big successes this year, Oppenheimer, Barbie, and Taylor Swift's concert series being put on, on screens, right? Mm-hmm. That is, it, it, is there a better argument 
that has been made in the culture that we should strive for more originality, that originality and actually commercial success go hand in hand, that we don't need like another superhero suit. Like it's like, we don't need 17 of these different iterations of the same movie. Like Mm -hmm. audiences wanted something new. They got something new and Barbie broke all of these records because it was something new. And whatever you may think of that movie, if you look at it purely from the success of an original thing succeeding in the culture, it's phenomenal. I'm like so happy that that happened this year. What I intended to do before we got on this interview was to ask you a bunch about the lessons that you've learned from the books that you've written because you've spent so much time studying the life trajectories of highly interesting people. And so much of what makes these people interesting is, you know, the, it, we think about the, the, the outlier returns that mm. they've had in their, either their career successes, their financial sex, successes, their creative endeavors, but so much of what made them those people is the foundation that they had when they were young and the a lot of its nature, but some of its nurture too, some of its circumstance, some of its, the freedoms that they were given to explore their interests. So I wanted to go really deep in how you, like what you've observed from going deep down the rabbit holes in places like finding Elon Musk's campaign platform <laughs> for when he was in college. Like you found so many cool things on these people and I wanted to go deep talking about that. We do not have time we to do not that have justice time to do that. now. <laughs> that could one hundred percent be another conversation that we have. So I would love to have you back, and we actually have the conversation. Watch In us person. not have that conversation again. But no, we should totally <laughs> have the have conversation that. Yeah. I intended to have here. Um, we could even do it because we, this was awesome. We covered so much ground, yeah. but that also is a conversation that deserves to be had. Yeah, no, I would love to do that. I think we should do a part two. You know, the intri- the really crazy thing would be to try to do it with like an audience or something. I think that'd be fun. Like to do it as oh, an that would event. Be awesome. Because I'm sure that's wow. something that like my friends, I have a bunch of friends in Austin who are, you know, in the sort of that that scene, like the <laughs> the David Perel scene. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, just people who for whom that would not be a big lift. It would be kind of fun to do like Hannah Franklin live, like your podcast live. Um, that's I, I think I know all of the people that I need to know to make that happen. Too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know I. somebody who can do the tech side. I'm pretty sure I have a few ideas on spaces. That would be super cool. Yeah. Uh, let's let's get something on the calendar. But either for way, that. let's plan on doing uh, the next iteration of this in person, even if it's just you and I. I think it'd be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Let's 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 do some scheming and figure something out, and uh, everybody can just be as excited about this as I'm right. going to be for the next few months. We're gonna leave everybody on that <laughs> that cliffhanger. Uh, for an undetermined date in the future when round two will be released, which is going to be awesome because I have a whole list of questions Great. I want to ask you. Um, be, you know, b- b- before that comes out, uh, if people want to know more about the work that you're doing. They want to find you. Obviously, your books are amazing, and I'm going to give them a big plug. You should People should absolutely read all of them, but especially the founders. It's really good. Uh, it's such an interesting hmm. story, and that's maybe good pre-reading for the conversation there you go. we'll have next time. Um, it's an it's an and, and for those who are listening, it's an ode to entrepreneurship in some ways. I wasn't uncritical about the people I was writing about. I was definitely dove into the story warts and all, but I wanted to, in some ways, like examine like what does it look like to to look at entrepreneurship or creating a company as a as a thing that we should celebrate more of. Like, what does it mean when a, random people come together and say we're going to do a new thing in the world? How does it affect them? How does it affect us? That was sort of the thesis of the book in some ways was, wait, when did we, when did we all decide like building business doesn't have drama in it, right? It has Shakespearean level drama in it and, and also has pathos and humor and warmth and like kind of big ingenuity at the the heart of it. So that's like a big piece of my, my, you know, my thinking about myself, but also my thinking about that company. Yeah. So where else? That's yeah. I, yeah. I love all of that. But people where people can find me to answer your question, uh, I'm mostly <laughs> mo- tw- Twitter X, whatever we're, we're referring to it as these days colloquially. Um, I'm Jimmy A at Jimmy A Sony. Um, I'm on all the other platforms as well. Not it's not I'm not active on any of them. But my books are probably the best way. And then for people who want to get in touch with me more personally, it's just JimmySony.com. You can find all my contact info and stuff. Um, but you know, my books are the best way to get to know me. Yeah, your books are great. Highly recommend. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for indulging all of my questions. Oh, it was was, so fun. This this was was a blast. Yeah, this was great. I'm looking forward to round two. Yeah.
Um, and let's make it happen sooner than later. I mean, I'm I'm flexible, and I love I love coming to Austin. Like it's like an excuse to get down to Austin, and so I'll take any <laughs> excuse I can get. I am always excited to provide excuses for people to come to Austin. So we'll we'll make this happen soon. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Hannah. Jimmy. Have a good day. All right, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for being here. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, please leave a five-star rating. Ratings are how this show gets discovered by other people and it helps me bring in better guests. And no matter where you're listening, please like and subscribe to the show to make sure you don't miss a future episode. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next week.